first of all, thank you to the organisers for arranging this session and my apologies for not being able to be there in person. The title of this session is a nod to the 1970 poem, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised by Gil Scott Heron. Scott Heron was himself referring back to a slogan of the 1960s Black Power Movement. Poem indexes not just recognition of an inflection point in history, but two other things. First of all, uh, an insistence on active participation. Uh, and secondly, on the importance of the material medium of revolution. You will not just watch it on TV. So the session, in my view, asks the question, who was conscious of change, but he goes on to implicitly engage two others. How did people engage in change actively and how did they do so through the material world? I want to ask these questions in relation to the shift between the medieval world and the early modern world in England in the 16th century. This is a time that is routinely discussed in terms of enclosure, reformation, rebuilding, the Renaissance, the Columbian Exchange. It's grouped within larger narratives of colonialism and capitalism. Now, discussing the 16th century in these terms immediately uh, leads one to deal with a number of interpretive difficulties, only a few of which I have time to engage with. Was there in fact a large, uh, such a decisive shift? Some art historians ask for continuity. Um, some uh, take revisionist views of the origins of the English Revolution. They some point out that virtually every century sees a quote unquote consumer revolution. Um, secondly, what was the time scale? Um, we might point to Tawney's century, uh, 1540 to 1640. We might point to W.G. Hoskins's dates for the Great Rebuilding, very similar. We might see this as simply not an admissible question archaeologically. Uh, Charles Perrett in the uh, quality of the archaeological record and before him Stephen Shannon have referred derisively to human interest stories, um, the notion that thinking about these issues of subjective experience is simply not admissible, certainly within a longer time scale. More fundamentally, um, there's the issue that experience of changes is at least partly a matter of scale. In this period, it's at least partly generational. I draw your attention to uh, William Harrison's famous um, passage, writing in 1587, pointing to material changes, changes in the everyday world, cited by old men dwelling in the village where I remain. Three things marvelously altered in, in England, it's a key text. So, um, there is, so I'm arguing that the change in this period is at least partly experienced in a generational way. I would also point out that some of the changes discussed by historians as gradual can be experienced within a community as very sudden. Um, for example, the progress of emparkment and enclosure within the English landscape, which unfold over centuries in one community, may unfold over a period of, 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 of just a year or even months. Now, people were certainly conscious of change. Um, Thomas Moore, writing in Utopia in 1516, is very clear um, that um, he is seeing change in the landscape around him and it's very clear that this for him is, is something very new. So he's going a long way towards suggesting this is a key inflection point. He roots this change in the landscape and his image of giant sheep um, eating up and swallowing down a whole fields, houses and cities has gone on to inspire a generation of undergraduate essays about giant sheep marauding in the English countryside. He attributes change to the individual moral turpitude of landowners, not to underlying structural factors. And his whole account is bound up with a moral conservatism and a nostalgia. And on a certain view, on a certain view, he gets it wrong. Um, vagrancy was not yet on the rise in early in the in the early years of the 16th century. Um, other historians have talked about depopulation as a, a Tudor fantasy. 
Moore's themes continue over the next century. If you look to country house poetry, Ben Johnson's uh, to, to Penshurst, um, you see the same themes coming up over and over again. Now, Thomas Moore's themes are not simply the preserve of the literate elite. They occur also, these, they are also shared by other social classes. If you look at the choreography and the values behind the popular rebellions of the 16th century, you find a shopping list of grievances which relate back to many of the concerns that, that Moore was raising. Uh, most obviously enclosure, depopulation, but these also tend to have a shopping list including changes around the Reformation um, and condemnation of foreigners, evil advisors to the king and so on. These um, popular demands uh, very often invoke the phrase custom since time out of mind, but they do so with a sense that this custom, this, this, this traditional um, manner of everyday life in the countryside is being broken, that something is changing. Um, so there is uh, the invocation of custom, but at the moment at which it is felt it, these things are, are, are under threat. Note also that many of the actions around popular rebellion are material actions, specifically actions of hedge breaking, ditch filling, leveling and so on. So we're seeing material actions and legal forces fighting it out in a way that's a precursor to the overt radicalism of the English Revolution, the demands of groups like levelers, ranters and diggers. Note also, with, uh, as we saw with, with Moore, what does this, at least at first sight, get wrong? Inflation is attributed to evil landowners, not to the forces of supply and demand. Um, policy is attributed to evil advisors, not to the processes of state formation. Um, it's possible to argue that the common folk did not recognise capitalism, but what they did recognise was greed. And they did recognise things like depopulation as harmful to the Commonwealth. So in passing, I want to make the provocative suggestion that maybe actually they got it right. Maybe actually these people saw the problems of their time far more clearly than some modern historians. So how do we think about this material? Well, beyond obvious things like new goods of, um, deriving from the Columbian Exchange, let me um, isolate three different themes. Let me talk first of all about the material practices of the Renaissance and particularly the way that Renaissance architecture, sculpture, motifs were reinterpreted by different social groups. Now, working with the Renaissance um, uh, is about in part working with um, objects and symbols such as classical pillars and ornaments that are self-consciously antique. It was called the old antique. So it involves a self-conscious historicism. And I would argue that the irony there is that that is in itself an acknowledgement of change. It's also about national identity. It's an acknowledgement of something that actually comes from somewhere else, the Mediterranean world. And so again, it also marks out paradoxically a national consciousness. Thirdly, it's also uh, about literacy. Rene uh, ideas of classical architecture art were disseminated through texts. And literacy, as Jack Goody pointed out many years ago, is also about consciousness of the historical past. So we can think about it in terms of the popular reception of classical style. We can look at artifacts like these. On the left, you have um, a detail of a traditional medieval gatehouse uh, dating from the 1570s at Torstock Court. Um, at around the same time, a screen to the right, again, in late Gothic style, but with these Renaissance roundels in it, reinterpreted in, in, in vernacular style um, from the local church. Uh, I'm arguing here that a self-conscious vernacular is in part a statement of political independence. The second area I think about is that of the Reformation and the way in which space and ornament and imagery in the parish church and in religious structures generally is reinterpreted during this period. 
and it's reinterpreted in quite a sophisticated way. Um, iconoclasm is often derided as, as, as a simple destruction of images, but behind iconoclasm lie very sophisticated ideas about the relationship with God, mediated through ideas about texts, about images, um, about very subtle things like the position or the orientation of the altar. Now, of course, many of the claims of the religious radicals were bound up with a self-conscious reference to the past, just as the demands of popular revels were bound up with a self-conscious claim of reference to the past. In the case of the Reformation, it was the claim that the Reformation was a return to the principles of early Christianity. Uh, I don't want to talk more about that except to note again the very old point made by Emil Durkheim that when we talk about God, we are talking about social relations. And here we're talking about a perception of change with social relations. My final example, my final example is from uh, archaeology itself, or specifically the growth of antiquarianism in the 1500s. And again, I would make the point that the self-conscious study of the past is, at least in part, a commentary on the present. It is a recognition of the past as different, a recognition of the past as something that, as a, as, as a foreign country. Um, and I would point out that behind the antiquarian impulse also lies an empiricist impulse. What I mean by that is that, um, uh, behind antiquarianism was the urge to go and look for yourself, not simply to trust old and ancient texts, but to go and do fieldwork yourself, um, to make observations yourself. And so it, it is in part a lack of trust and again an awareness of his historicity. I'd point to Richard Helgerson's point, uh, point in relation to maps, that when you uh, place a country on a map, you draw a conceptual divide between the country and the kingdom. His point, the people used cartography to fight out different ideas, ideas which he suggests memorably end up on the battlefields of the English Revolution. So what I'm suggesting in conclusion is that the transition between the Middle Ages and the early modern period and specifically how we see that tradition in the material record, how we see it archaeologically, gives us the opportunity to study ontology as a substantive issue. What do I mean by that piece of jargon? What I mean is that what is being fought over is not simply or only change. It's not simply or only about people's different social classes consciousness that change was happening in the world around them and that there was an inflection point in history. But rather and more deeply, this change involved the very nature of things, landscape and material culture itself, and how things come to signify or come to be in the world. And I've tried to show that there is ample evidence that this fight, this fight over the nature and the meaning of things, was a popular as well as at literate or elite levels, even if we see it most overtly in texts like Thomas More or in... Um, I think the mistake here, I think one of the reasons why we don't see this as clearly as we might, is because for all the popularity of the material term in the historical and social sciences, there is still a lingering anti-materialism. We still tend to think or talk about this period as one in which people are thinking something through and then they're expressing those thoughts in particular kinds of material culture or in buildings or in landscape. Um, and this, this lingering um, uh, anti-materialism, I think is, is one of the issues that, uh, that we continue to, to struggle with in archeology span and uh, in, in, in understanding this period. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you for listening. I hope this has been of interest. Uh, comments or questions are very welcome. Thank you very much for listening.